You know, I was born in New York City on the Lower East Side. I came from a very large family. We were seven sisters and five brothers. That doesn't mean that my father was a great lover. It means that we were very, very poor. You see, we couldn't afford any coal or any wood. And in the wintertime, it was freezing at our house. And when you go to bed and you're that cold, anybody can be a great lover. <laughs> We'd lived in California, I might have been the only son. Uh, you know, before the show, Jack and I were, were, uh, were sitting in the dressing room, and I took a look at him, and he, and he looks great. Look, I look good, too. You know, you know, in, in show business, you can't allow yourself to get old. I know an actor, Clarence Evans, he's, he's 86 years old and he had his teeth capped and his nose fixed and his face lifted and he wears contact lenses and he wears a toupee, looks so good nobody knew he was dead. <laughs> his, his wife still doesn't know it. In fact, she's suing him for divorce. You know, Jack and I have been very close friends for about, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, this is great. This was written after World War I by, uh, by, um, by uh, Buddy De Silva, Irving Caesar, and George Gershwin. Now, with writers like that, it's got to be a great song. And it's highly dramatic, so please pay attention. Perry? <laughs> Say, have you ever been away? Say, have you ever been away? Have you ever missed the dear old USA? Then you get a itching in your shoes. See how quick you'll get the blues. See how quick you'll get the Yankee Doodle Blues. You're singing. There's no land as grand as my land From California to Manhattan Isle North, south, that sunny skyland I love every mile They're playing Yankee Doodle That's the melody that keeps ringing in my ears Yankee Doodle That's the melody makes you stand right up and cheer I'm coming, USA I'll say I love you Make me lose those Yankee Doodle Blues, oh. They say that Europe is wonderful with all its ancient junk. It's not as good as Kokomo, cause Kokomo's the bunk. We couldn't see your London, it was covered by a fog. We had to move from Paris, cause we couldn't eat a frog. From Bay, we went to Old Cologne and started on the round. But Old Cologne smells sweet and pretty as it sounds. A Russian Bolshevik, you try to get my scalp. And then I wore my welcome out sliding down the Alps. Hello, Miss Liberty, I'll say you're a bear. And when the custom officer said to me, what do you declare? I answered, Yankee Doodle. That's the melody that keeps ringing in your ears. Yankee Doodle. That's enough of that. Okay. <laughs> That, that number is so good, I'm going to save it for my finish. Well, I got a finish. All I need is an opening now. As I said, Jack, Benny, and I, we've been, we've, been, we've been very close friends for about 55 years. And there's a reason for it. I always told him how much I love his violin playing. And he always told me how much he loves my singing. And that's how we've stayed friends all these years. Lying to each other. And sometimes I'm introduced as the, as the comedian's comedian, which is absolutely ridiculous. It's because I can make Jack Benny laugh. Now, Jack Benny makes the whole world laugh. I make him laugh. I'm the comedian's comedian. He makes a fortune. <laughs> and I don't even make him laugh. He makes himself laugh. Like, I ran into him once, and I wasn't doing anything. And he looked at me, and he started to laugh. And I says, what are you laughing at? I'm not doing anything. He said, I know, but you're not doing it on purpose. 
I'll tell you how this all happened. The first day I met him, the next day he phoned me. And and in the middle of the of the of the conversation we were we were we were disconnected. And that night we had a date for dinner. And when I came into the restaurant he laughed and he hit the table and he fell down and he pointed to me and he said, George, he said, That thing that you did to me this afternoon is the funniest thing that anybody has ever done to me. I said, What did I do? He says, hanging up in the middle of a phone conversation. That's the first laugh I ever got from Jack Benny. Up until then, I didn't realize I was the comedian's comedian. <laughs> and, 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 and that's happened 55 years ago, and to this day, every time I phone him, I still hang up on him. <laughs> he doesn't laugh at it anymore, but if I didn't do it, he'd think I was slipping. <laughs> and Eddie Cantor went to his house for dinner one night. I says, Eddie, you want to have some fun? Make Jack a $10 bet that if he calls me on the phone, I won't hang up on him. Sure enough, my phone rang, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and Jack says, aren't you going to hang up on me? I said, no, I got a half a canter's bet. <laughs> that, that he didn't laugh at. <laughs> but the things that he laughs at, you won't, you won't believe this. We were at a party one night. Now, he had a piece of white thread stuck on the lapel of his coat. And I said, oh, so that's what they're wearing now. Do you mind if I borrow it? And I took the piece of white thread off his lapel and I put it on my lapel. Now that's, that's the whole bit. And I'm sure nobody's gonna steal that from me. He fell down three times. Next day I took a piece of white thread, put it in the box and sent it to his house with a little note on it. And I said, thanks for letting me wear this last night. An hour later, Mary called me up. She says, that piece of white thread got here about an hour ago, and he's, Jack is still on the floor laughing. <laughs> she says, as soon as he stops laughing, I think I'm going to leave him. <laughs> and then before we were married, we used to eat together every night, and eating with Jack is quite an experience. He never, he never likes what he orders. He only likes what you order. <laughs> And uh, we were in this restaurant, and he had lamb chops, and I had a steak. And he looked at my steak, and his mouth started to water. And he said, would you, would you like a piece of my lamb chop? I said, no, then you'll want a piece of my steak. <laughs> Fell down twice. <laughs> and the next night, we're in the same restaurant. He said, your steak looked so good last night. It looks delicious. I'm going to order it tonight. I said, good, I'll have lamb chops. He looked at my lamb chops and his mouth started to water. He said, would you like a piece of the steak? I said, no, then you'll want a piece of my lamb chop. He only fell down once because he heard that joke before. <laughs> Another night, he had roast beef and I had chicken. He looked at my chicken, I says, hold it. I says, you like chicken? He says, yeah. I says, you take my chicken and I'll take your roast beef. He looked at my roast beef and his mouth started to water. <laughs> I didn't say anything because sometimes even a comedian's comedian gets tired of getting laughs. <laughs> then one night we were invited to Louis B. Mayer's house. He had a musical to introduce his new singing star, Jeanette McDonald. And Gracie and Mary and Jack and I went. And after dinner they had two rows of chairs around the piano. And when Jeanette McDonald got up to sing her famous uh, song, Indian Love Call, a hush fell over the room. And I leaned over to Jack and I whispered to him, I said, Jack, when this lovely lady starts to sing, it would be very rude if you were to laugh. <laughs> well, she no sooner got the first note out of her throat. His shoulders shook, he laughed, he fell down, they had to carry him out of the room. So he not only ruined Jeanette McDonald's song, but he ruined Louis B. Mayer's musicale. See, you see, I'm not the only one that made him laugh. Jeanette McDonald used to make him laugh, too. <laughs> well, after all, you can't blame him. Indian Love Call is a very funny song. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here's a cute song. It's not an opening song. But if I ever find an opening song, this is going to be my second song. Perry, Monkey Rag. 
Way down in Africa, every evening in the bamboo trees, some chimpanzees, monkey banjos, nightly would be strumming. They would be humming in his voice and buzzing bees. A big baboon head, a band, was the best in monkey land, played right and grand. This big baboon was requested to compose a tune one night in June. Wrote a finger snuggy and he called a finger monkey and he gave it to the plan to play. Oh, the night was a sight when the monkeys there began to swing and sway. When the monkeys do the monkey rag, Swerve's monkey was on a jag. Laugh until you have sight, the crack by the curl of the tail, wiggle the back. Everybody's crazy about the rag that rag. Hunky chunky the monkey, they call the thing the monkey. Hunky chunky the monkey. Okay. That's, that's going to be my second song. Now, I don't find an opening song by Tuesday, we'll have to break this up. Now I'd like you to meet uh, my conductor and my arranger and a great musician, Perry Botkin, ladies and gentlemen. Perry. And also all these great musicians, fellas. And my piano player, Morty Jacobs. Morty. I must tell you, last night, Morty and I took a walk down La Cienica, and we went into a little nightclub, and, and, and uh, a beautiful young girl, about 19 years old, came out on the stage with absolutely nothing on, and she sang on a clear day you could see forever. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd never go into that place again. The soup was ice cold. Nudity, nudity, nudity today is really something. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, there was a show, Oak Calcutta, and everybody on the stage was naked. You're going to see a movie today, and men and women get to bed, uh, go to bed together naked. That's not my kind of show business. I'd catch cold if I smoked a cigar without a holder on it. <laughs> if I got in bed with a naked girl, she better be able to sing harmony. And the only thing I take off is my right sock. <laughs> my age, my right foot is the only thing that still works. <laughs> Let you in know a little sad story. Last Monday, the big toe on my right foot stopped wiggling. <laughs> it's kind of bad because that's the foot I dance with. I don't know why people are making such a fuss about nudity. The reason the day goes by that all of us don't take our clothes off. When I get undressed to go to bed at night, am I supposed to stand in front of a mirror and applaud myself for 20 minutes? I think 15 minutes is plenty. <laughs> and when I was young, it was different. I remember playing the Chicago Theater during the Chicago World's Fair. And I was on the bill with Sally Rand, the fan dancer. And she was supposed to be very, very naughty. She did nothing. She came out with, with, with flesh-colored leotards. And then the stage on the lights were dark blue, you could hardly see her. And when she did the fan dance, the fans were so big, they covered her completely. And that was it. In fact, she took sick one night. I took her place, and nobody knew the difference. <laughs> You know, you know, about, about three weeks ago, I recorded two songs. Simon Smith and his Dancing Bear and Dayton, Ohio, 1903. This is, this is true. They were written by Randy Newman, a young composer who was really great. And he played piano for me when I, when, I, when I made the record, and I noticed that Randy is sitting in the front row. So let's get him up here to play for me. Come on, Randy. Let's sing a song of long ago 
When things were green and moving slow And people would stop to say hello Oh, they'd say hi to you Would you like to come over for tea? And me, it's a real nice way to spend the day in Dayton, Ohio, on a lazy Sunday afternoon in 1903. Let's sing a song of long ago when things could grow. And days flowed quietly The air was clean and you could see And folks were nice to you Would you like to come over for tea? And me, it's a real nice way to spend the day in Dayton, Ohio, on a lazy Sunday afternoon in nineteen hundred and three. Isn't that a darling song? And and, uh, and and now, Randy, let's do let's do Simon Smith. That's 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 on the other side of the record. So, Randy, turn over. I may go out tomorrow if I can borrow a coat to wear. Step out in style with my sincere smile and my dancing bear. Outrageous, alarming, courageous, charming. Oh, who would think a boy in bear could be well accepted everywhere? It's just amazing how fair people can be. How fair people can be. Places where wealth and faces all stop to stare. Making the grandest entrance is Simon Smith and his dancing bear. They love us, won't they? They feed us, don't they? Oh, who would think a boy in bear could be well accepted everywhere? It's just amazing how fair people can be. And my dancing bear Who needs money When you're funny The big attraction everywhere Will be Simon Smith and his dancing bear It's Simon Smith and the amazing Dancing bear Thank you, Randy, for coming up here tonight. And to show my appreciation, any time you want a date with my with my sister Goldie, I'll be, I'll be glad to fix it for you. In fact, she'll pay you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Randy Noman. I think I'm right. Uh, oh, right here, I was supposed to do something with, with Alice Cooper. But he, he 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 couldn't he couldn't come and snake bit him. 
I know just how he feels because a lot of my partners bit me too. Anyway, I want you to sit back. This is really exciting for you. I'm going to have you meet 14 kids that really get the job done. At the uh, Mike Curb Congregation. Here they are. Let's bring them up. Get around me, kids. We've got to do something together here. Come on. And get close so I can keep warm. <laughs> You're on something there. That's it. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's do something together. Let's do it pretty. Huh? Okay. Do it nice. Like you're not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, in my key. I could be happy, could be sad, could be good, could be bad. It all depends on you. All depends on you. Could be humble, could be proud, could be lonesome in the crowd. It all depends on you. All depends on you. Could make money and spend it, go right on living or end it. You're to blame, honey, for what I do. Stay in show business. <laughs> could be beggar, could be king, could be almost any old thing. It all depends on boom, 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 boom. That's nice. Hold that note again. Wait a minute. That note is nice. Let me find a song here that fits me. You, 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 boom, 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 boom. It's too fast. I'm not. I'm not wearing anything. I can hurt myself. <laughs> I wanna. I want a song that fits me. You. Let's take you. 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 I'll find something in a minute. Do. 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 Take sunrise. Sprinkle it with you. Yeah. Look, kids. You know that I've got a lot of influence in show business. How would all you kids like to be stars overnight? Okay, then hold on to that note and let me find a song. You, 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 you made me love you. I didn't want to do it. You made me want you, and all the time you knew it. All the time you knew it, all the time you knew it, all the time you knew it, all the time you knew it. You made me happy sometimes, you made me sad, and there were times, dear, you made me feel so glad. So glad. That's pretty. Let's do that again. So glad. So glad. You made me cry for so glad. so glad. 
You made me cry for I didn't want to tell you. Didn't want to do it. Tell you. Do it. So glad. So glad. I want your love, that's true. Yes, I do. Indeed, I do. You know I do. You didn't want to do it, but you did. Yes, we enjoy everything. Well, most everything. I wonder one party I didn't enjoy. It was my own fault. Everything I did that night was wrong. I went to Vincent Price's house. He um, had a very intimate party, about 400 people. Anytime you, you, you put 400 people into a room that can only hold 70, they, 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 they got to be intimate. And Vincent took me around the house. He showed me his, his walls are all covered with beautiful paintings. And, and he said, George, he says, isn't it exciting to see some of these great masterpieces? Well, uh, exciting. He spoke to the wrong fellow. I know nothing about paintings. I, the only thing that excites me is if the super's hot. <laughs> but but I, didn't want, I didn't want to look stupid, so I painted, I, I pointed to one of the paintings, I said, that's a beautiful painting, and the artist who did that is, is, is going places. He says, he came and he went, that's, that's, that's a Michelangelo. I says, well, I'm sorry I missed him, when did he leave? Never said a word, he just stared at me for about 30 seconds, and then pulled open my breast pocket and poured his drink into it. Guess it was a bad martini. And I was sitting at a very nice table. I was sitting with Edie Adams, and there was the Jack Lemons, and the Walter Matthaus. And Groucho came over to the table and told Edie Adams that he dreamt about her last night and thanked her for an exciting evening and walked away. <laughs> and Edie turned to me. She said, I had the same dream. She said, Groucho is nothing. I walked out in the middle of it. Then I noticed that Carol Channing was leaving. It was early. I says, Carol, why are you going? The party is just getting started. She says, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm just going home to change my clothes. I says, why? You look, you look, you look beautiful. She says, I do. And she says, look over there, wearing the same outfit I'm wearing. And she was right. It was a cerise jacket with, with green beads and a big gold medallion and, and a ruffled uh, shirt with a ruffled front and lace cuffs and bell-bottom striped pants. And the, and the shoes had diamond buckles on them. And Liberace looked beautiful. In fact, I was going to ask him for a dance, but I didn't want to crush the ruffles on his shirt. And, and, and you know, you, the women and the men, they dress alike. You can't tell who's who. I, I made a terrible mistake. I walked up to Governor Reagan. I said, uh, Liza, I saw you in Cabaret, and you were marvelous. He just, he just looked at me and poured his drink into my, into my coat pocket. By now, I was getting pretty soggy. <laughs> but the uh, funniest side of the evening was Joel Gray dancing with Raquel Welsh. <laughs> he, looked, he looked like he had three heads. <laughs> All I saw was the back of his neck, but I think he was smiling. And, and she, had, she had to do the leading. I guess he couldn't see. He ran into the wall twice. 
and the orchestra was playing a wild rock number and he was doing a waltz. I guess when he danced with her, he not only couldn't see, he couldn't hear. <laughs> and Warren, Warren Beatty was there. This, you know, every, every girl at the party tried to date him. <clears throat> you know, somebody told me that Warren Beatty goes out with two or three girls every night. I wouldn't do what he's doing for all the money in the world. Well, come to think of it, I couldn't do what he's doing for all the money. <laughs> I'm lucky if I can hold on to my electric toothbrush. <laughs> but I kind of felt sorry for him. You know, I've been around for a lot of years. <clears throat> Pardon me. I've been around for a lot of years, so I thought I'd give him a little advice. And I went over and I said, Warren, I said, instead of running around with all these girls, when you go to bed at night, why don't you do what I do? Why don't you have a bowl of hot vegetable soup? He poured his drink into my cummerbund. <laughs> and when I danced with Joshua Gabor, I had to take very small steps because by now my pants were shrinking. <laughs> After the dance, I said to Joshua, that's a beautiful ruby you've got in your belt buckle. It turned out to be the cherry from Warren Beatty's cocktail. <laughs> Then I, then I, then I, then I went back to my table to dry off. And the minute I sat down, I felt somebody tugging at my pants leg. I looked under the table, it was Foster Brooks. He says, hand me a glass of scotch. I gave it to him, I said, Foster, you better sober up. If you keep drinking like that, it's gonna ruin your image. He hiccuped and poured his drink into my shoe. <laughs> But now I had booze in my shoe and in my pockets and my cummerbund. And to make matters worse, when I drove home, a cop stopped me. I says, officer, what did I do? He says, nothing, I smelled you going by. <laughs> I said, well, you won't believe this story, but I just came from a party, I says, and Foster Brooks and Warren Beatty and Governor Reagan and Vincent Price poured liquor all over me. He says, you're right, I don't believe the story. I said, would you, would you like to feel my cummerbund? He said, he said, wait a minute. He says, are you George Barnes? I says, yeah. He says, my wife, Millie, is crazy about you. She watches you all the time on all the talk shows. She thinks you're great. She, she's practically in love with you. I says, well, thank you. I says, maybe, maybe, maybe she'd like my autograph. He said, she said, you would put it right here on this ticket. <laughs> well, that was my evening that night. And it wasn't the greatest. Wait a minute, hold on to your seats. Ladies and gentlemen. This is my opening song. Augustus J. McCann was a hempback married man. He has been fighting with his wife since married life began. One night at half past three, while out upon a spree, a motor knocked him down and out and nearly broke his knee. One guy looked down and said, I think this bloke is dead. But when he said, let's take him home, McCain jumped up and said he hollered, don't take me home, please don't take me home, tell me what did I do to you, oh, 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 have a little pity, I'm a poor married man, in such a peace I roam, I'm with you most anything you do, so please don't take me, I'm not going, you can't make me. Yes, I'm staying. Oh, please, please, don't take me home. Thank you very much. Well, that was my opening song. At the beginning of the show, I told you in show business, all you need is a great opening and a great finish. Well, you just heard my great opening. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna hear my great finish. I've had a marvelous time. You've been a charming audience. And thank you very, very much. <laughs>